Today we're going to go over, uh, well, a, a, a new chapter introduction, and then, and then we're going to uh, dive into Lecture 4.1. So the new chapter intro is just, oh man, I even forgot to finish it. That's funny. Um, anyways, it's rather short. I'm just uh, introducing the chapter um, that is going to be tough for people who have not taken mechatronics, but um, fortunately it's just one of several chapters in this course. Um, no, it's actually, uh, I think it's, it's attainable, but it is going to be a challenge. So. Just so everybody knows, it's probably the toughest part for those of you who haven't taken Mechatronics. Uh, with, with that being said, yeah. um, what, what chapter should we focus on and what books? Would it, would it be the actual systems book still that we're in, or would it be the previous one? Or like yeah, so, um, and I can, I can uh, expand on this a little bit, but it, essentially it's the volume one material that talks about linear graphs, which I think is like chapter, well, Chapters one, two, and three, I think, of the, first of, of the volume one of the notes, yeah. Um, and you don't need everything that's in them, but I think that uh, I could go through and like tell you like which lectures are the most important. Yeah. Essentially, you can skip the stuff that's specifically about electrical or mechanical systems uh, on your first pass. So. We now consider the lumped parameter modeling of fluid systems and thermal systems. So we're expanding our horizons from electrical, mechanical, electromechanical. We're going to include now fluid and thermal systems. The linear graph-based state-space modeling techniques of volume one uh, are called back up to service for this purpose. Recall that this method defines several types of discrete elements to be defined in a given energy domain. In volume one, electrical and mechanical. And in volume two, we'll do fluid and thermal. So um, not that we're not doing electrical and mechanical anymore. It's just that we're focused on fluid and thermal um, more in this class, or at least in this chapter. Um, the strong analogs between the mechanical and electrical systems from volume one are expanded to include fluid and thermal systems. This generalization allows us to include, in addition to electromechanical systems, interdomain systems including electrical, mechanical, fluid, and thermal systems. So you could do like mechanical fluid system, electromechanical fluid system. Like the, for instance, you could do the electrical circuit that drives the pump's motor which turns into a pressure head that the pump creates, right? So uh, these are super useful modeling techniques across engineering. Um, and we're going to expand a little bit on when to use this versus to use your techniques from fluid dynamics class. Uh, so yeah. Uh, good. So that's actually all from the intro. Um, and now I'll just, I'll just open up. We'll just do the next one as part of this because it's just a continuation. Um, yeah. So it's four, one. So, there we go. So, four one, fluid system elements. Detailed distributed models of fluids, such as the Navier-Stokes or Bernoulli equations, um, are necessary for understanding many aspects of fluid systems <coughs> and for guiding our, uh, their design. For example, a pump or an underwater vehicle um, would be an example of one that we would need this detailed distributed fluid model. Like for instance, uh, where is the boundary layer? Um, wh where is turbulent flow happening? Where is laminar flow happening? Uh, what's the drag 
force on some uh, sh airfoil shape? What's the lift you can get from it? Like there are all kinds of different questions that you need the distributed full fluid dynamics perspective for. Um, however, a great many fluid systems are networks of pipes, tanks, pumps, valves, orifices, and elevation changes. And at this system level, a different approach is required. You're not going to model a large, um, say, uh, uh, food manufacturing plant that has like milk, something like that in it that you're processing and stuff. You're not going to do the, the detailed fluid dynamics of how every particle uh, or, or volume of fluid, small tiny volume of fluid, is behaving in this huge system. Okay, that's, it's not realistic and it's also not that useful uh, to find out. But what you care about are things like how, uh, if you have a pump that has this much head, how much does the, uh, 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 how, what is the largest volume you could possibly see given like the outflow of some machine? Um, how big do you, should you design your tank to be? That type of thing is, not really uh, answered by questions of, of like Navier-Stokes equations and stuff. That's not, that's not the modeling technique that you want. This sort of modeling technique, which looks at it sort of at a system level, like, oh, okay, there's this much flow rate here, there's this much pressure here. If you evolve this over time, there will be you know, this much volume that will show up. Um, in the worst case scenario, say you're doing like a storm drain, something like that, uh, a network, what's the, well, the most amount of water you could see in, that need, would need to be held in this chamber uh, without flooding the area? A dynamic model would help answer that question. So, lots of stuff that you can apply this to. Fluid systems uh, uh, on the system level uh, can also be modeled in this sort of lump parameter perspective. So as with electrical and mechanical systems, we can describe fluid systems as consisting of discrete lumped parameter elements. The dynamic models that can be developed from considering these elements are often precisely the right granularity for system level design. So for a mechanical system, we might say, oh, okay, this uh, table we're going to model as being a mass with like some legs that have some stiffness and some damping in them. Um, and this is a good model of the table for considering how it transmits vibration through it. Of course, we you know, aren't getting into the material properties of the table, right? We're just lumping it into dynamic properties. How does it transmit vibration through it? Similarly, with a fluid system, we're going to do similar stuff. We're not going to worry about the details of where turbulent flow and where laminar flow is happening. We're going to just say, okay, roughly speaking, this tank fills up like this. There's this uh, 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 flow rate coming through this pipe. That type of thing um, we can answer. So we now introduce a few lump parameter elements for modeling fluid systems. So we're going to first introduce some variables and that type of thing. So uh, first of all, a volumetric flow rate Q and pressure drop P, let these be uh, 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 input to a port in a fluid element. Since a fluid, as for fluid systems, the power into the element is the flow rate times the pressure, we call Q and P the power flow variables for fluid systems. So uh, this is analogous to uh, force and velocity. It's analogous to the, uh, uh, especially there's a really nice analog between fluid and electrical systems. So um, if you think of Q as being current and P as being voltage, and in fact a lot of times when you learn about electronics you'll use fluid analogs. <laughs> Did you guys notice that? To talk about like thinking about charge flowing current as being like a, a fluid that's flowing from one point to another point and how there's like a pressure difference and then it'll, it'll force fluid in one direction. That is the reason why it's so useful for 
uh, giving intuition about electrical systems um, is that uh, these fluid systems behave in sort of analogous ways. So, yeah. Nice analog between fluid and electrical systems. Um, where we're thinking of P uh, uh, being like voltage and Q being like the, uh, the current. Okay. A fluid element has two distinct locations between which its pe pressure drop is defined. Um, we call uh, a, a reference pressure ground. So you guys have all taken fluid, right? You took fluids in the fall. Taking it now. Okay, taking it now. Okay. So um, you guys have talked about the difference between uh, gauge pressure and absolute pressure, right? Uh, and so the real, the only difference there is, is your reference, right? What's the reference for the pressure value that you're given? This is very analogous to voltage, right? Uh, you have to have a reference voltage for your voltage to mean anything. Um, it's the same with pressure. Are you talking about atmospheric pressure? Are you talking about the difference of pressure between two locations? What are you talking about? And so you have to have a reference with pressure. Um, and that's why I specifically call it pressure drop because uh, it's, it's important to remember that pressure needs this relative uh, 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 reference. Okay, work done on the system over the time interval zero to T is defined as the integral of the power. And of course, we already defined the power to be the product of Q and P. Therefore, the work on a mechanical, or uh, on a uh, typo, fluid, on a fluid system, is the integral of Q, P, um, over the interval from 0 to T. Just plugging that in. The pressure momentum, which is a, a quantity that you guys may or may not discuss in fluids. It's not as commonly discussed. Uh, however, it's just, so we use capital gamma for that. Uh, it's just the integral of the pressure. Okay, so if you integrate the pressure, you get the pressure momentum. Similarly, the volume is the integral of the volumetric flow rate. We're using volumetric flow rate here, not mass flow rate. That's important to recognize. I know you guys use both in fluids, but we're primarily going to focus on volumetric flow rate in this class. Um, we now consider two elements that can store energy, called energy storage elements. Also an element that can dissipate energy to a system's environment, called an energy dissipative element, and two elements that can supply power from outside a system called source elements. You might notice that this lecture follows the exact template of the previous lectures on mechanical and electrical systems. And that's very... Uh, 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 purposeful, intentional on my part, because we're trying to draw these analogs, and I want you guys to see this in a very analogous way. And I can now scroll down because I upped my game a little bit, and, and also we have no more issues with these symbols coming in. I fixed all that this week. I stayed up late and just felt like doing it, and it was good times. It was fun. Thank you. I feel like that should be acknowledged. Yeah, I did not lose my life. <laughs> Everything is better in the world now. Um, okay, so fluid inertances. Oh, by the way, next Friday we're not having class. Uh, no, um, it's because it's Engineering Awareness Day, and I have to. I'm giving a demo during this class, and all the seniors are also. So I have nobody to cover the demo during this class because everybody who I could maybe recruit is in this class. So <laughs> I can't. It doesn't work. Yeah. Is there a quiz? Yeah, there will totally be a quiz. And I, <laughs> I, will, I will possibly upload an additional lecture uh, for Friday to make up for that. I want you guys to get your money's worth. I don't want you guys to feel cheated out of a day of class. You guys paid good money for this, or somebody did. So, um, <laughs> okay. Fluid inertances, and this is the most awkward of them. This is the one that people are uh, most uncomfortable with in terms of the fluid and thermal elements. So the analogs are pretty good for every other element besides fluid inertance. 
It's a weird one. We aren't used to thinking like this, but I'll try to convince you that it's reasonable. So, when fluid flows through a pipe, it has a momentum associated with it, right? You've got all this fluid moving in one direction, right? So it gets some momentum. Uh, the more mass, which is the fluid density by its volume, so you know how mass is defined in terms of fluid, uh, uh, moving in one direction, uh, and the faster it moves, the more momentum, okay? This is stored kinetic energy. And we have to take that into account in our model in specific instances. We'll talk about when that makes sense. The discrete elements, uh, we now introduce uh, 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 models the aspect of flu uh, this aspect of fluid system. So we're going to talk about uh, a fluid inertance um, that's going to attempt to model this phenomenon. Okay. So a fluid inertance is defined as an element for which the pressure momentum gamma across it is a monotonic function of the volumetric flow rate through it, okay? A linear inertance, which is how, what we'll focus on in this class, uh, is gamma is proportional to Q with constant of proportionality I, where I is called the inertance and is typically a function of pipe geometry and fluid properties, okay? So this is a little bit awkward for six in terms of intuition for us, but uh, we'll, we'll derive what the inertance is for a pipe with, with fluid flowing through it, and I think it'll make a little bit more sense then. Um, okay, so this is called the element's constitutive equation because it constitutes what it means to be an inertance. This is what we're defining an inertance to be. It's uh, an element that you can roughly uh, model with this formula, okay? That roughly behaves like 4, 6, at least uh, for a linear one. If it's a nonlinear one, uh, maybe there's some nonlinear relationship there, but we'll focus on linear. Although there are nonlinear inertances, we can often use a linear model for analysis in some operating regime. The elemental equation for a linear inertance can be found by time differentiating equation 4, 6 to obtain. So we get dq dt. So we, move, we switched sides of the equation, right? We time differentiated the right hand side and we got dq dt. The i is a constant. Um, and we're actually going to solve for dQ dt, so we'll divide both sides by i. So we get 1 over i times uh, d gamma dt is, if you go back and look at uh, what the definition of gamma is, um, is just the pressure, d gamma dt. So gamma is just defined as the integral of the pressure. So the derivative of gamma is just the pressure. And now this is an equation that relates our two power flow variables, right? Our flow rate and our pressure, which are our two power flow variables. So therefore, it's in what we call an elemental equation, okay? We call it the elemental equation because it relates those power flow variables. An inertance stores energy as kinetic energy making it an energy storage element. The amount of energy it stores depends on the volumetric flow rate it contains. For a linear resistance, uh, sorry, not resistance, inertance, a linear inertance, we get 1 half IQ squared as being the energy. So it stores energy in this, essentially this volume of moving fluid, right? So if you're not, if that fluid is just sitting there and the flow rate is zero, it's not storing any energy. The inertance I for a uniform pipe can be derived as follows with reference to the section pipe of figure 4.1. So let's take a look at this. Um, we have a pipe. We're just looking at a cross section of it. And we're assuming that there is fluid in this pipe filling the entire thing, and that uh, uh, we have a uniform density throughout the fluid, um, rho, 
that it has a uniform cross-sectional area, A. Um, that, and we're going to look, we're going to analyze this um, element here, this finite element that has a length L and it has flow rate Q through the pipe and a pressure drop across it from P2 to P1. So there's some pressure difference from one side to the other side. And so we would say that P for this, for this section, of, uh, for this element, is equal to uh, P2 minus P1. For an incompressible fluid flowing through a pipe with uniform area A, length L, with uniform velocity profile, which is just a convenient fiction, right? Because we know that in a pipe, a velocity profile actually looks something like this, right? Where it's slower at the, at the side, at the um, uh, boundary than it is uh, in the center. It's going to move fastest in the center. We're going to assume that it's all moving at the same velocity, which is terrible to assume. I mean, it's not a good assumption if you're trying to figure out what the relative velocity is between the center and the side. But uh, for bulk modeling purposes, this is actually going to work OK. So. Yeah, yeah. Does this whole thing just look like viscosity gradient? Uh, pretty much. I mean, it, it doesn't in the sense that it doesn't in the sense that it assumes that there's no viscosity, or it doesn't assume anything like that. But it does assume um, that the material sort of flows around uniformly, uh, at least at, at least at a high level, at least at the level that. Um, Volumes accumulate and pressures uh, evolve. Like th that's what that's what it assumes is that at that level, the viscosity of the fluid isn't a big deal. We can the viscosity of the fluid is going to come into play when we think about the uh, resistance of the fluid going through an orifice, for instance. That would that would matter. Yeah. Ultimately, what velocity of the fluid uh, do we end up using? Is it some kind of average of that velocity profile? Yeah, so Q you can think of as approximating the average of that element. So if you get a flow rate through a section of pipe, um, when you solve you know, your dynamic equations, you get a certain flow rate. You're assuming that that's the average flow rate in that entire uh, 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 pipe. So yeah, if you looked at, you know, the, it's going to look, it, it, won't, it won't be, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Uh, if you have your velocity profile in the pipe looking like this, um, it's not going to give you the max or something like that. It's not going to give you this profile either. Um, however, what it'll do is it'll kind of give you like an average. That's what its goal is. It's kind of assuming that it's average. You know, it's okay to just do that. And it, and it works pretty well, actually. Surprisingly well, considering how much of an approximation it is. So. OK, uh, so it, with a uniform velocity profile, an element of, of fluid obeys Newton's law, okay? from which several interesting equalities, oh, I forget I can go down, can be derived. Oh, I brought in the full thing. Ah, what the hell, I'll show you guys. OK, so I was going to, I was going to, write this out for you. But we can say that F equals MA, right? The force, the resultant force on this, uh, the sum of the, all the forces on this element of fluid, thinking only in one direction, along the pipe, right? That force is equal to the mass of the element times the acceleration of the element. Um, and remember, we're assuming that's some nice uniform. There's only one velocity that describes it, not a whole profile. We don't want to get into partial derivatives in this class um, because we don't want to get into solving partial differential equations. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so if we, uh, we want to derive what the inertance is of this pipe section. So what we're going to do is try to transform these force and velocity variables into uh, flow rate variables and 
pressure. So one way to do that is to divide um, both sides of the equation by the cross-sectional area of the pipe, which instead of having force on the left-hand side, then gives us the pressure on the left-hand side, which is nice. Force divided by area is pressure. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we get um, uh, M over A, and then we can substitute in for the mass. The mass of that element of fluid is its density times its volume. Its volume is the cross-sectional area times the length of the pipe section. The areas cancel, so you get rho L time derivative of, instead of the velocity, we can say, oh, well, that's just the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area, right? The volumetric flow rate is in meters cubed per second in SI. Um, area is in meters squared, gives us meters per second. That's where we got that, right? Uh, and then we have uh, this A, this area, cross-sectional area, we said it's constant. So we're going to pull it out of the derivative, rho L over A, dq dt, which gives us a, a relationship between dq dt and P, which is the elemental equation for an inertance. So we've found that. And we now have an expression for the constant that's out front. Um, so 1 over I, where I is the inertance. So in the last equality, it's clear uh, for a uniform pipe and the assumptions above that the inertance is rho L over A. So for a uniform cross-section of pipe, um, we can assume this. However, when you actually do model a system, if it's depending on the system, you might want to measure an inertance. This is a good way, it's a good place to start in terms of a sort of theoretical prediction of what it should be. And it gives us intuition. For instance, the inertance is going to be greater if you have longer, thinner pipes, right? And more density. But usually that's not a parameter that we're thinking about changing a whole lot. But the, the, the L over A means that if you have things that are long relative to the cross-sectional area, so long and thin, are going to have more inertance associated with that. In fact, we often ignore inertance in modeling a pipe unless it is relatively long and thin. So when we're going to, we're going to model pipes as part of this, as you know, one of the main things that fluid systems have, pipes going around, right? So when we model a pipe, we're only going to consider it to have an inertance associated with it, an, an, an uh, important amount of inertance, if the length of it is significantly larger than, longer than its area. So you got a pipe section that's like this wide and like this long, don't have to worry about it. But if that, instead of having a pipe that's um, this wide and this long, if you had one that's, you know, um, this big in diameter and this long, then that would become significant. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so that's inertances, the least intuitive of them, I think. But hopefully you guys can kind of buy into that. Mainly, we know we need to use an inertance element uh, when we've got those long, thin pipes. That's the main, the main time to know. Otherwise, uh, we, we don't really need to use an inertance. Okay, uh, fluid capacitors. When fluid is stored in tanks or in pressure vessels, it stores potential energy via its pressure drop, P. Okay, so uh, this is one of the first types of, of uh, control systems where, with water clocks and fluid filling up tanks. This is like going back to the Greeks here. This is sweet stuff. So, um, for instance, a tank with a column of fluid will have a pressure drop associated with the height of the column, right? This is like straight up standard fluid stuff, right? Probably done a lab where you've got pressure head and columns of water and a U-tube, whatever. We have a U-tube here? I don't mean like the internet thing. Yes. Do we have one? Probably. Seems reasonable that we would have one. I don't know. Okay, so, uh, 
Good. So, so it would have a, a you know, a, if a column of, of fluid in a, in a tank is going to have some pressure drop associated with it, and that's going to store energy. So it's, it's analogous to how an electronic capacitor stores energy via its voltage. Okay? For this reason, we call such fluid elements fluid capacitors. A linear fluid capacitor with capacitance C, pressure drop P, and volume V has the constitutive equation that the volume is equal to the capacitance times the pressure. Once again, time differentiating the constitutive equation gives the elemental equation, which is once again rearranging. So dP dt equals 1 over C times what is dV dt? That's the volumetric flow rate. Q. Okay, so that's, that's nice. Another elemental equation. Notice that this is sort of the uh, uh, dual to the other elemental equation. So dP dt equals 1 over CQ is kind of like dQ dt equals 1 over IP, but it's opposite, right? So fluid capacitors um, have that elemental equation, and they can store energy, making them energy storage elements, in fluid potential energy, which for a linear capacitor is 1 half Cp squared. So if you fill up the tank more, you get more pressure, you get more energy stored. Right? Fluid dampers. Fluid, oh, actually, no. Dang it. I was, I was going to call them fluid dampers, and I was like, nah, I think resistors is better. We've been doing this electrical analog thing. Fluid resistors. Fluid resistors are defined as elements for which the volumetric flow rate Q through the element is a monotonic function of the pressure drop across it. Linear fluid resistors have constitutive equation, and it turns out elemental equation, Q equals 1 over R P, or P equals R Q, um, where R is called the, the fluid resistance. Fluid resistors dissipate energy from the system to heat, making them energy dissipative elements. And I didn't mention in here on the notes, but you know, something we can talk out is you know, what types of physical components tend to give us these resistive elements. So, hmm? Nozzles, yeah, like, like, uh, like valves, choke points, orifices, when you've got something flowing out of a tank that uh, has like a small orifice on it. This, you can derive the re, uh, an equivalent resistance for the orifice depending on its geometry. Um, yeah, so fluid resistances, and also just um, even in pipes, right? You're gonna have some friction loss through uh, just flowing that fluid through the pipe, and you're gonna have some, some losses. So in, we don't have in uh, fluid system, so you know, if we're doing this electrical analog thing, uh, wires are like kind of like pipes um, in electrical systems, right? So it, it, uh, a wire and a pipe are kind of similar. But the thing that's uh, nice about a wire is it has very, very little resistance associated with it. But if you have a really long wire, remember, we have to worry about the resistance in the wire. For pipes, Really, any length of pipe is going to give you some resistance. So every single time you flow fluid through a pipe, you have to put in a resistance there. Um, you're going to have you're going to have uh, resistances that are uh, really you have to have some insight into what the system is, and sometimes you just have to do some measurements to determine what the resistance is going to be. Um, you can try doing some prediction based on the geometry. Uh, and the type of pipe you have, that type of thing. But uh, at the end of the day, there's nothing quite like measuring something. Uh, yeah, so that's fluid resistances. Okay, flow rate and pressure drop sources. So fluid sources include pumps, runoff, 
etc. So you can get fluid entering the system from outside the system and it's going to come uh, 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 via different mechanisms. So you can have something that's providing a certain pressure or a certain flow rate uh, or maybe some some uh, mixture of those two in terms of um, having a, a real source instead of an ideal one. But we'll talk about ideal ones first. An ideal volumetric flow rate source is an element that provides arbitrary energy to a system via an independent volumetric flow rate. The corresponding pressure drop across the element depends on the system. So you might have a pump that you would say it provides, you know, five cubic meters of fluid per second, okay? Constant. Or maybe it's sinusoidal or whatever it is. And whatever pressure drop across that pump there is, is just a, 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 a consequence of how the system is reacting to that that constant velocity, or, uh, uh, constant flow rate. So this uh, flow rate pump uh, is not something that really exists, but of course there are certain approximations. So a lot of times a pump will have a uh, little feedback controller on it that will make it, you'll tell it to run at a certain flow rate, and it tries to run at that flow rate. So that's, that would be a, a, an example of an, a, an attempt to approximate an ideal volumetric flow rate source. Similarly, pumps could be an ideal pressure drop source, an element that provides arbitrary energy to the system via an independent pressure drop. Uh, the corresponding volumetric flow rate through the element depends on the system. So similarly, you could have a pump that's providing a certain pressure, but the flow rate is going to be varying, and it's just trying to make that pressure the same. Uh, a, a nice uh, pressure source that you can provide is actually a column of fluid. A pressure drop uh, based on just height. Um, and actually, this is a really nice pressure regulator. I've used this before um, to regulate pressure. Um, you can just put in, we call it like a bubbler. Okay, sidebar. Um, if, you want, if you want to provide a constant pressure to something. Uh, say you've got this tubing, it goes down to the bottom of this column of fluid, water maybe, um, and you fill this thing up to some height. The difference in height there is something very specific. And that, uh, that gives you a very predictable pressure. Now, if you have a, um, uh, the, the way to do this is to have, um, if the pressure increases over here, it pushes gas, air maybe, or whatever it is, through this, and it, and it puts, puts out bubbles. That's why I call it a bubbler. It puts out bubbles, it keeps the, the height, the height stays the same, the pressure, it, it exerts back in, at least in the steady state, is the same. Um, and you don't end up with, as long as you've got good positive pressure over here, you're fine. You don't want to suck in water usually. <laughs> but if you're making sure you keep nice positive pressure, um, then you're fine. Okay, so that's a little fun. Like, but that gives you a constant, that's actually a, a pretty decent approximation of an ideal pressure source. There. Okay, real sources. <laughs> Usually pumps, I don't know what you guys are laughing at, but it's probably bad, um, cannot be ideal sources. <laughs> Honest to God, that is not the application I was talking about. You're not wrong, but also... That is not, it was, I could take a picture of it and show you guys. This exists in a lab that I work in. It's, it really does. Okay. For research purposes, it's a real thing. That's so funny. Usually I would pick up on that, but I didn't pick up on that. That's good. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, in this, I'm up here lecturing about fluid mechanics, and you guys are over there just talking about drugs. Jeez. 
<laughs> All right, generalized element and variable type. So let's finish this up. We're almost there. So in keeping with the definitions of volume one, pressure is in a cross variable. It's defined between two points, right? So it's like voltage. It's like velocity. It's like uh, uh, what it? angular velocity. Um, similarly, uh, the flow rate Q is a through variable because it flows through the elements, right? Consequently, the fluid capacitor is considered an A-type energy storage element. Similarly, the fluid inertance is a T-type energy storage element. And then clearly, a fluid resistor is a D-type energy dissipative element. And so all of the stuff that we've learned about those types of elements in Volume 1, we can now apply to Volume 2's uh, uh, fluid systems. So pressure sources are then across variable sources, and volumetric flow rate sources are through variable sources. Let's do a little example. So we're going to draw a linear graph of this. Um, use a schematic to draw a linear graph of the system. So I, I will do more examples. Um, so what we want to do is recognize that when we draw a linear graph, the nodes of a fluid system are going to be pressure. Okay? So these are open tanks at P atmosphere, right? So we will draw a reference node down here, ground, and that's going to be our atmospheric pressure node. Okay. Um, we have a pipe, maybe this is like overflow water coming from somewhere, runoff or whatever, uh, or maybe it's coming from a different process, and it's flowing into C1, and we're saying that this is a, an ideal um, uh, flow rate source. So QS is specified from outside, uh, and it's going to flow into C1. Let's, let's look at this and say, how many different distinct pressures can we identify in this, in this system? So we've got this, this tank. I, I labeled it C1 because it's going to be a fluid capacitor, capacitor, right? It's a capacitance associated with it. It's a tank that fills up. And the pressure difference between P atmosphere and the bottom of the tank is an important pressure. That's what stores energy in this tank, right? In fluid potential energy. So uh, if we call this, uh, we could just label this like P1. Um, there's a distinct pressure there. Uh, there's also a distinct pressure on the other end of this pipe. So it's going to flow through this pipe. And there's going to be another pressure over here. P2. I've labeled the pipe R1 and I because it has a resistance and an inertance associated with this pipe. It must be a long pipe. I didn't say that explicitly, but since I put an I there, I'm assuming that you think, oh, it must have an inertance associated with it because it's a long pipe. Uh, similarly, another tank, and then we have a valve here, um, and so a valve and an orifice where it flows out, so we're definitely thinking about doing R2. And it flows out to, once again, P atmosphere. Um, so we've got, uh, we don't really think, we could think of you know, another pressure over here, but actually this pressure too and this pressure over here are the same. So that's really just one pressure. Uh, and then it goes out to P atmosphere. So we have atmospheric pressure, P1 and P2 as definite nodes here, right? And Going in, so we, we could say that this, this, C, this P1 is associated with this uh, C1 element, right? The fluid capacitance goes from uh, P1 to atmospheric pressure. The other, one, other fluid capacitor goes from P2 to atmospheric pressure, C2. And maybe I'll put it on this side, it's a little cramped. And then um, we have ourselves a, uh, a, a flow source, QS, that goes into, that goes into our C1, QS. And then we're connecting these two reservoirs via R1 and I. And there's always the question, is it in parallel or is it in series? And the key way to determine if they're parallel or in series is, do they share the same pressure drop or do they share the same flow rate? Which is more important? And in this case, uh, 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 we need to think of this as being, they need to share the same flow rate, 
So they have to be connected in series, which does generate this node here, which is kind of an arbitrary node and it doesn't really mean anything. So there's no real sense of like, this is the pressure right here or something like that. It isn't really, that isn't really what the, the there, there's not really like a physical meaning of the pressure right there. Um, but what we wanted is that the flow rate is equal. When it goes through a pipe, you're gonna have an equal flow rate through it um, uh, for each element. So you have to do them in series. And the last one is R2. It goes from P2, which this is the P2 node, right? This is the P1 node. Uh, from P2 to atmosphere, so we get R1. R2. Oh, sorry, R2. Thank you. And that's it. That's, that's really, that's how we do it. So we'll talk more about how to turn that into a mathematical model. We'll do some examples of that. But uh, that's just like getting a, our feet wet, if you will, on fluid systems.